Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series for the months of July, August, and September of 2014 is on the teachings of Jesus. It's a very interesting session, series. I hope you've had a chance to listen to some of the previous sessions. This particular one will prove to be quite enlightening, I think. It's entitled, The Law of God, and it's lesson number 10 in that series for September 6 of 2014. I hope you have a Bible handy because we'll be jumping back and forth. We want to look at the teachings of Jesus both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So I hope your fingers are fast. Um, and before you, we start actually doing that, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Our kind and loving Father, we consider it a great privilege to gather around this table and to talk about you. And may the words that your Holy Spirit guides us to say be a an influence on those who are watching at some distance to encourage them to think about what this lesson is all about and perhaps talk about it with their friends as our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. The law of God. What comes to your mind when someone says the law of God? Ten Commandments. Yeah, most Adventists would say Ten Commandments right there, bang. But to the Jews, what did it mean when, when they said the law of God? More likely a Jew in Jesus' day particularly would have thought, okay, he's talking about the five books of Moses. The Torah. The Torah, as they would have called it. The law of God. What are the five books of Moses? That would be the first five books in the Old Testament. That would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So well, those were the law of God in the Jewish that, mind. In the Jewish mind, those were the law of God. I mean, Moses was basically the one who was the father of their <coughs> nation. And as the father of, nation, of their nation, he had written down, this is the, you know, the Magna Carta, if you will, for, for their nation. Yeah. Well, what we're going to try to look at is law versus grace, different approaches to the law and so forth. And that issue, that question has been discussed in Christian circles basically since Christianity started. What kind of an impact is the law supposed to have on our lives? And what kind of an impact is God's grace supposed to have on our lives? But let's try to at least get a little feel for what the two sides believed back in the days of Jesus. What was the attitude of Pharisees toward the law? You might say obsessive. Ob obsessive, okay. They knew it and uh, they kept it in their minds. They had it memorized and they knew how it should be kept. No question. There was no question in their mind but that they were the saints because they were keeping, in fact, you almost tend to be independently wealthy to be a Pharisee because you had to fast two days a week and by the time you did all the other things you were supposed to do in a given week, there was hardly time to do anything else except, except worship God. Quote, worship God. Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made it very clear what he believed should be the correct attitude toward the keeping of the law. Now, at what point in time did the Sermon on the Mount occur? All you people with your... More than one and one half years into his ministry. You're cheating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jesus started out his ministry in Judea. We know almost nothing about that first year and a half of his ministry. He, of course, was baptized and he they had the wedding at Cana and a few other things like that. But basically, we know almost nothing about it. Jesus was trying to stay under the radar in Judea because he knew that if he got too, you know, he became too popular, too many people knew about him, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the scribes would be all over him. So after a year and a half of his ministry, he... Um, so what, weren't those first one and a half years pretty much described in the first, what was it, five or six chapters of John? Yeah, well, the first really, yeah, f yeah, four chapters, five four. chapters, four chapters of John, yes, yeah. And at that point in time, John the Baptist was arrested and put in prison. And Jesus said, okay, it's time for me to move on. 
things are getting too hot here in Judea. And he went to Galilee. And it was when he got to Galilee that we have the uh, one year time that he just really pushed the gospel in Galilee. And that was the time he started out that year, or very soon after he started that year, by appointing the twelve, and that's of course is in, in Matthew 10. And uh, unfortunately, Matthew reorganizes his material a little bit. So the call of the disciples described in Matthew 10, but his sermon, which according to the other gospels, follows that call, is back in chapter 5. So what do we learn in the Sermon on the Mount? So the Sermon on the Mount was the first sermon or near the first sermon after he had chosen the 12 disciples? Exactly, and he had started his work in Galilee. Yeah. So if you read through, if you know something about what the Jews believed, and you read through even the first few verses of Matthew 5, he just almost starts down the line and says, okay, you believe this, but this is wrong. You believe this, but this is, you know, this is, and, and, and almost everything he said was in contradiction to what their beliefs were. Didn't he say it a little nicer than that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little nicer than that. He had all day to say it, and I only got one hour. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you believe. This is what you say. Here's how I expand it. Here's yeah. what you say. Here's how I expand it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that the right way for a young rabbi or teacher or pastor to start his ministry? You people have got it all wrong. Get their attention. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. If they don't march away before he's had a chance to say anything else. Can you antagonize and instruct at the same time? Well, Look at Matthew 5, 17 and 19. We have read this verse many times. Probably all of us have memorized it. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with. Not until the end of all things. So then whoever disobeys even the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, whoever obeys the law and teaches others to do the same will be, the, will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So you know what, what you need to do? Get out there and obey the law. Right? That's what the Pharisees did. Well... Jesus stated in really pretty much unequivocal terms that it was not his purpose to overthrow the teachings of the Old Testament. When he talked about the law, he, was, he, he, he may have been talking about just the Ten Commandments, or he really focusing on the Ten Commandments, which apparently he was. But there's other parts. He quotes from several other parts of the writings of Moses, and sometimes quotes from the rest of the Old Testament. So what scripture did they have in Jesus' day? What we call the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. So, recognizing how far the Jewish teachers had corrupted the true teachings of the Old Testament, Jesus was trying to present the truth as it was originally intended. So then, what does it mean to, to, to fulfill the law? Live it, carry it out. Yeah. Live it to its fullness, right? What, when speaking of the law, the Jews often refer to the five books of Moses. We've mentioned that already. But in this passage, Jesus seems to be focusing especially on the Ten Commandments. In, in which passage? In well, the... in, in, in Matthew 5. We're going on to talk about the rest of Matthew 5. Okay? So how do you interpret Jesus' repeated statement, it was said of old, but I say. What does that imply? Trying to change their thinking. Most people are wrong? Yep. Sometimes. <laughs> As a young rabbi, did he have the right to overturn the under their understanding of the law? What was Jesus' correct relationship to the law? He was the leader of it. He Many modern Christians have suggested that the God of the Old Testament, 
Joanne? Uh, was the harsh, exacting, arbitrary Father God. By contrast, the loving, caring, you know, forgiving God of the New Testament is Jesus. They, 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 they recognize it. That's the way it is. Where did that idea come from? Because people created God in their own image. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, where did it come from? That picture came from the devil. Yep. Yep. Wow. Lucifer. Who was the God of the Old Testament? Christ. Look at some very interesting passages. Let's start with Luke 4, verse 20 and 21. Now, Luke 4 is Jesus, the first part of Luke 4, Jesus comes back for the first time. Well, well, no, I shouldn't say for the first time, but he comes back to preach to his hometown. He's in Nazareth, and what does he do? Remember when a rabbi comes in, and he's, he's asked to, to preach, or whatever you want to call that, to give the service on Sabbath morning. What did he do? Goes to the synagogue. The synagogue. He goes to the synagogue, and then what happens? Reads from, this, from the scroll. He's expected first to open a scroll, the appropriate scroll. He's expected to read a passage, and then do what? He rolls up the scroll, puts it back, because the scroll is very precious, very expensive. You don't want to mess with it. So you put it back, then you sit down, and then you start preaching. You explain what you've read and what it's supposed to mean. That was the usual way it was done. So Jesus rolled up the scroll. I'm now looking at Luke 4, verse 20. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him. And if we went back to the verses up above there, where did Jesus quote from? Isaiah. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. And yeah. what did they know about? Yes? What did Isaiah 61 say? Well, maybe we should go back and look at that real quick. Well, actually, it's, it's right here. It, so he, Jesus, Jesus quotes knew it. to pick up the correct scroll. Yeah, and he knew how to read it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Okay. That's his quoting. This is slightly different than the direct quotation from Hebrew because this actually comes from the Greek. That same fray, uh, paragraph, isn't that what Jesus told John the Baptist when John the Baptist says, are you the Messiah? Didn't Jesus say some of those very same things? Similar. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. What did Jesus say next? This day, this passage has come true as you've heard it being read. Then he gave back the scroll to the attendant and sat down. Mm -hmm. And what did, they, what did they believe about that passage from Isaiah 61? They had been taught all their lives that that passage refers to the coming of the Messiah. So when he said, this day, that passage is fulfilled in your eyes, before your eyes, he was saying what? I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. And what did they do? Put it out. Angry. They wanted to kill him. Yeah. Is that when they first started to want to kill him? Oh, the Pharisees were already trying to kill him long before that, down in Judea. But this was the first time in, in, in Nazareth. Was it evident to the Pharisees that he was fully keeping the law as he was living? Well, that depends on how open-minded you're willing to allow the Pharisees to be. They, they knew he was not keeping the law according to their rules. But they couldn't find... See, if they had been able... They spent years trying to nail him on exactly that point. They were always trying to see, well, you know, surely we can find some way in which he's directly disobeying the Old Testament. Yeah, they we, couldn't. Yeah. They found lots of places where he would disobey their rules. But they were looking for a place, they were looking for a place where they could say, okay, look, here's what the Bible says, and here's what Jesus has done. He's, he's obviously a sinner. He's, a, he's an unrighteous man. He needs to be destroyed. Couldn't find it. 
about the Sabbath, when you heal on the Sabbath and just, yeah. Lots of things. Yeah. Well, look at another. Our, our, pa our question here is, who is the God of the Old Testament? Then he said to him, this is Luke 24, 44. Now, now Jesus is in the upper room. It's after his resurrection. He's giving sort of the final instructions to his disciples. Then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about whom? Me. Me. In the law of, the Mo law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. How much of the Old Testament does that include? Love the whole of the Old Testament. And it's about who? Christ. That about me. Not about me, but about Jesus speaking here. I'm quoting him. So everything written about me in the Old Testament, does that mean that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament? You're just about two steps ahead of me. Again, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look at another one. John 5, 39, you study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures, remember that was a time when there was only the Old Testament available. These very scriptures speak about Adam and Noah and Abraham and... No, these scriptures speak about who? Jesus Christ. Me. Me, Jesus speaking. And that's Jesus speaking, talking to people a whole group of people who had memorized the Old Testament. He said, remember all that stuff you stored in your brain, spent years and years memorizing? That's about me. Well, Stephen recognized the truth about the Messiah being the God of the Old Testament, as recorded in Acts 7, 4, 38, when he said, He is the one who was with the people of Israel assembled in the desert. He was there with our ancestors and with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and he received God's living messages to pass on to us. Who does Stephen think was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus. No question about it. The Apostle Paul wanted to make that very clear to his readers. After describing the experience of the children of Israel with Moses in the wilderness, he stated in 1 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, all ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Christ himself, the Messiah himself. Christ is the Greek, Messiah is the Hebrew. Same thing, the anointed one, okay? Well, for Seventh-day Adventists, what did Ellen White say about this question? Christ was not only the leader of the Hebrews in the wilderness, the angel in whom was the name of Jehovah, and who veiled in the cloudy pillar, went before the host, but it was he who gave the law to Israel. Hmm. If we're talking about the law of God, and what does it say? <laughs> Jesus was the one who gave that law? Hmm. I think some people may miss that. <laughs> many, yeah. Maybe we better read it again. Christ was not only the leader of the Hebrews in the wilderness, the angel in whom, or the messenger, angel in Greek means messenger, and whom was the name of Jehovah, and who veiled in the cloudy pillar. That cloud of pillar, of, fire, of cloud by day and, and pillar of fire by night, who was that? Jesus. That was Jesus, who went before the host, but it was he who gave the law to, to Israel. Amid the awful glory of Sinai, Christ declared in the hearing of all the people, the ten precepts of his father's law. It was he who gave to Moses the law engraved upon the tables of stone. Is there any question about what law he's talking about here? No. It is the voice of Christ that speaks to us through the Old Testament, Patriarchs and Prophets, 366, paragraph 2 and 3. It was Christ, reading on, well, this is another passage, but it's still Ellen White, it was Christ who, amid thunder and flame, had proclaimed the law upon Mount Sinai. The glory of God, like devouring fire, rested upon its summit, and the mountain quaked at the presence of the Lord. The hosts of Israel, lying prostrate upon the earth, had listened in awe to the sacred precepts of the law. What a contrast to the scene upon the Mount of the Beatitudes. Under the summer sky, with no sound to break the stillness, but the song of birds, Jesus unfolded the principles of his kingdom. Yet he who spoke to the law that day in accents of love 
was opening to them the principles of the law proclaimed upon Sinai. Thought from the Model Blessing, page 45, paragraph 1. So Jesus is apparent to the world who can yell in times of fire, who can gently heal wounds, uh, watches a sparrow drop. So Jesus will do whatever is necessary to form and train and teach his people. Yep. And the Jesus who was on top of Mount Sinai is now speaking to them in the Mount of Blessing. You know, in the beginning it says uh, the Word was with God and everything was made through the Word. It's been the Word ever since the beginning of the Bible through the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's been the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, which is another name for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, another passage. This one is found in um, Desire of Ages, page 307. He knew that spies stood ready to seize upon every word that might be wrested to serve their purpose. He knew the prejudice that existed in the minds of many of his hearers, and he said nothing to unsettle their faith in the religion and institutions that had been committed to them through Moses. Because who gave it to Moses? Christ himself had given both the moral and the ceremonial law. He did not come to destroy uh, confidence in his own instruction. It was because of his great reverence for the law and the prophets that he sought to break through the wall of traditional requirements which hemmed in the Jews. While he set aside their false interpretations of the law, he carefully guarded his disciples against yielding up the vital truths committed to the Hebrews. Desire of Ages again, page 307. Question. Mm -hmm. If God, if Jesus gave the ceremonial law as well, why does he say it has been said this, but I tell you that? Is it because they interpreted what he was giving them wrong, or what happened? Now you're trying to get ahead of me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so no, no, that's good. Thank you. I mean, that means that this lesson has a natural flow. Okay? So that's exactly where we're going to now. Why would Jesus apparently sort of contradict what he said in the Old Testament? And that's why, I mean, let's be honest with the facts. So many Christians today think that, okay, Jesus is apparently arguing with the Ten Commandments from, or in, even in the rest of the law from the Old Testament, so that must mean that it's no longer in force, right? Question, do yeah. uh, most people not think that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ? No, is, is that almost, most univer people? almost yeah. universally believed that the God of the Old Testament was the Father yes. and the God of the New Testament was Jesus. And if you stop and think about that, that's completely impossible because Jesus, for the first, well, at least through the Gospels, Jesus was a human being here on this earth. He can't be the God of the universe while he's a human being here on earth. It has to be the Father. Is, is this a teaching of other churches or is that just the... It is, understanding. it is a standard teaching and it's, understanding in almost every church. It's the teaching. It's the teaching, mm -hmm. deep-rooted. And in Islam, Jesus is not even a god of either one. He's a prophet. Yeah. So if in other Christian churches, if Jesus kind of slips you through the back door to get into heaven, um, what's their explanation before he lived and died on this earth for all the people that lived? That's a challenge for them. And basically what they would say, well, Jesus made the provision and is retroactive. Okay. Well, if we had a chance, we would read a bunch of passages here from the Old Testament. Maybe I'll read a couple. Uh, look at Genesis, I'm um, sorry, Exodus 20, verses 13 and 14. These are very well-known passages. This is what, the sixth, sixth, sixth commandment, seventh commandment, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery. Right there. How could it be more plain, blunt than that? Okay? And if we had time, we would read Deuteronomy 5, 17, and 18, which says almost the same thing. Exodus 21, 24, Leviticus 24, 20, and Deuteronomy 19, 21, which basically, these are the passages that Jesus is quoting in his Sermon on the Mount. And then he's going to say, okay, I disagree with the way you understand these things. Jesus quoted these passages, and then appeared to argue with them. But he was not arguing against the actual teachings from the Old Testament. Instead, he was arguing against the interpretation that had been placed on those teachings 
by the Pharisees and the scribes. Look especially at the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees as described in Matthew. This is just a brief picture. Matthew 23, verses 3 to 5. So you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. Do not, however, imitate their actions because they don't practice what they preach. They tie onto people's backs loads that are heavy and hard to carry, yet they aren't willing even to lift a finger to help them carry those loads. They do everything so that people will see them, look at the straps with scripture verses on them, which they wear on their foreheads and arms, and notice how large they are. Notice also how long are the tassels on their cloaks. We do this so people will see us, right? Last summer when I was in Jerusalem, visit, I visited the, the Western Wall there, and over in the side, there were a bunch of people there that had, were all wrapped up with these things and on their foreheads and so forth. And anybody who was interested and was a faithful Jew could come over there and they would show you how to put all those things on. Well, Jesus went on to describe them quite in detail in Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give to God a tenth even of the seasoning herbs such as mint, dill, and cumin, but you neglect to obey the really important teachings of the law such as justice and mercy and honesty. These you should practice without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain a fly out of your drink, but swallow a camel. How terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of your cup and plate while the inside is full of what you would uh, have obtained by violence and selfishness. Blind Pharisee, clean what is inside the cup first and then the outside will be clean too. How terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. This is really how to influence. Mm. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so um, the uh, rules, the rules in the book on how to be right said you have to carry this bag this way or do this this way, but none of the rules included the word justice or the word mercy was not in the rule book or the word honesty. No. And those are the words that should have been in there first. Okay, let's, let's, let's look at some of the passages that Jesus, what Jesus actually said. You've heard that it was said, I'm back in Matthew 5 now, verse 27. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. Uh, okay, let's stop there for a second and, and, and note that. Okay. I knew a woman whose husband made her get all the magazines he got. This is when magazines were more popular. And give, he, she was to cut out every picture of every woman in that magazine before she gave it to him to read. That was yeah. her duty as a wife. Wow. You have to buy two magazines? <laughs> in order to, so you don't cut the text out of the... Yeah, I don't know how she did that, but she got all the magazines be before... Anyway. Wow. But it'll still be in his mind every time. It's a missing person, a missing but, piece. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just... Well, they got he was trying. Those that have to put a, a yeah. sack over, over people's heads so they can't see they them. See so us. They, they can't move, see move, us. Move to Iran. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. or, or Afghanistan, I Well, she got tired of cutting out pictures. That's not yeah, I would think so. Well, it, it, be, it becomes very serious because, I mean, look at today. You can't drive down the road without seeing pictures of women. What do you do then? <laughs> What's amazing is the Internet knows when I'm on the Internet and they give me old people advertisements. Mm. When my nephew has been on his, the computer, I see his computer and I go to a site, I am appalled at what they're advertising to him. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, they know who's on this computer. And I almost feel like saying, this is not Mike on this computer. This is me. You know, but uh, they target you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Matthew 29 and 30 goes on to say some pretty serious words. What do we do with these? You have heard that was, well, we already read that part. So if your right eye causes you to sin, 
take it out and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs than for your whole body to go to hell. Please explain that. Okay, well, first I'm going to ask you, how many of you have friends who are missing an eye or a hand? <laughs> I had a client years ago that heard that passage and he cut his left arm off, or left hand off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I lived in a part of the world some years ago where we had patient, I had patients with fingers cut off because in that part of the world, if you, if you were caught stealing something, at least a finger. After the first Gulf War, a, f a photographer came back from Saudi Arabia and was telling me how great the, uh, the society was in Saudi Arabia because they don't have any stealing. As you, mm -hmm. as you steal, they cut your hand off. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. not very many people with, with only one hand, or with two hands. But, but Gone. for our viewers, please explain those verses. We okay. are not advocating this type of behavior. Okay, in verse 29 and 30, Christ was using a figure of speech. This is quoting from our Bible study guide. Of course, one could argue that it would be better to go through life mutilated than to forfeit eternity with Christ. However, rather than pointing to mutilation, which would be contrary to other biblical teachings, if you go back to Le Leviticus 19 and chapter, uh, verses 27 and 28, or Leviticus 21, 17 to 20, it says you can't participate in the church services if you're mutilated some way or another. Jesus was referring to the control of one's thoughts and impulses. In his references to plucking out an eye or cutting off a hand, Christ was figuratively speaking of the importance of taking resolute decisions and actions toward guarding oneself against temptation and sin. Well, like the woman that was required to cut out pictures in the magazine mm -hmm. before she gave them to her husband, that didn't take care of the problem. No. Uh, I mean, so you could cut off to here, to here, to here, to here, and you'd still, your mind is what God mm -hmm want you to change. Well, so do you think that this uh, quote from the Bible study guide is, is a good representation? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, God doesn't intend for us to be cutting our hands off, and that kind of stuff. But he does intend for us to realize that we need to focus our thoughts and our minds on the right things and not on the wrong things. And that it's serious. And my ancient France in the patristic society, patriarchal society, would have said, the problem is you ladies, you look too good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in the final weeks and months of Jesus' ministry on this earth, the Pharisees, the scribes, and even the Sadducees sought by every possible means to trip him up and to get him to say something that they thought they could use to condemn him. So, look at Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. Suppose a man marries a woman and later decides that he doesn't want her because he finds something about her that he doesn't like. So he writes out divorce papers and gives them to her and sends her away from his home. That's what you had to do. You know, in, 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 in Sharia law, where, which, is trying to be, which is being promoted in some parts of the world today under Islam, it's, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, get out. It's India. like that. You don't need anything written. You're done. They say uh, they were trying to trip Jesus up in what he said mm -hmm. to give uh, them something to accuse him by. Do you think in today's world, as the pressures are on, they're going to try to trip us up in something that we say? Um, I mean, Satan is still at it. Absolutely, and he's got, had a lot more. He's had several thousand more years of practice. So we should pray for extreme wisdom. We should pray for Jesus' way of answering. Yeah. And here's a sample of how Jesus answered. Some Pharisees came to him and tried to trap him. I'm now reading from Matthew 19, starting with verse 3. Tried to trap him by asking, Does our law allow a man to divorce his wife for whatever reason he wishes? Now, they figured they had him either way. If he said yes, they would have said, Okay, then how come you're not following these guidance? If he said no, they would have said, how come you're putting away the instruction given to Moses? But what did Jesus do? He was way ahead of them. He answered, haven't you read the scriptures that says that in the beginning, the Creator made, male, made people male and female? 
And God said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one, so they are no longer two but one. No human being must separate then what God has joined together. The Pharisees asked him, Why then did Moses give the law for a man to hand his wife a divorce notice and send her away? And Jesus answered, Moses gave you permission to divorce your wives because you are so hard to teach. And of course, in the original language, it's because of the stiffness of your necks and the hardness of your hearts. But it was not like that at the time of creation. I tell you then that any man who divorces his wife for any cause other than her unfaithfulness commits adultery if he marries some other woman. His disciples said to him, notice their attitude, if this is how it is between a man and his wife, it's better not to marry. I mean, would you imagine <laughs> linking yourself to this woman, one woman, and having to stay with her your whole life? Well, you say that today. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus answered, and you know, when I tell people down at the clinic, I, I, again, I do, probably shouldn't be talking so much about myself, but I deal with a lot of people who have a lot of problems. And they, you know, people come in and they're always complaining about their husbands or their wives. And I say, well, I've actually been married for 47 years. <laughs> 47 <laughs> years. Yeah, yeah. Nobody does that anymore. Nobody <laughs> does. And then I say, <laughs> my parents have been married for 72 years. And then my they just. God. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Can't believe it. Jesus answered, This teaching does not apply to everyone, but only to those to whom God has given it. For there are different reasons why men cannot marry, some because they are born that way, others because men made them that way, and others do, do not marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let him who can accept this teaching do so. And what happened to their question? <laughs> it was God. He completely, you know, he's, he just superseded their question. Well, the problem was that in their day, there were two, I mean, they were always trying to quote the fathers, okay? There were two main groups of, of interpretation in those days. One group was called the followers of Hillel, and the other was called the followers of Shammai. And so in Jesus' day, there were two rabbinic schools that, were interpret, that interpret this text in two different ways. Hillel understood it to allow divorce for almost any reason, while Shammai interpreted it to mean only explicit adultery. The Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus into taking sides with one school or the other. And of course, you could guess that what would happen if he took sides with one school or the other? The people who were on the other side would have jumped all over him, right? But the, the women could not divorce the husband. It's only no. the husband. Well, it, a woman is a piece of property, property don't you know? Yeah. I think that's also because a lot of the things Jesus tells you not to do, there's, uh, there's always another reason, a practical reason as well, because the husband could just kill her. Mm -hmm. You know, it's best. In, in India now, they, yeah. a lot of these husbands, but when the women turn 40, you, they divorce and they marry a 19 or 14 or 15 year old. Yeah. And a lot of those 40, 45, 50 year old women, they're sitting uh, outside begging for a bowl of rice mm -hmm. because they've never had anything. They just throw them out. Today. Well, and, and, you know, and not to criticize other groups, but you know that when, when a, a, a family gives away their daughter, there's a huge dowry that goes with mm -hmm. it. And there's some guys who are trying to get rich by accepting the dowry, and then somehow okay. by accident the woman dies, and mm. then another woman by accident dies, and <sighs> they just keep the dowry. And it's today, 2014. Well... What do you think Jesus would say to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the 21st century on this question? Pretty much what he said in the Bible there. Yeah. Should we be taking Jesus' words seriously? Yeah. About plucking out eyes and cutting off hands? <laughs> oh. Or should we be taking seriously his teachings, his intentional teachings, you know, how to really live up live out according to the the new testament here cell phone is this <laughs> this sounds crazy to us it's really scary should it be is it possible you know and and our quarterly just says it it should be it should be really scary and straighten people's lives out and the question i would have for us can god scare us into doing what's right well he could but he, he would not 
us, then it, it's not God. I mean, if God could scare us into doing what's right, why didn't he try that with Satan back in the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. Prove Satan's accusations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> back on to the mutilation part. Yeah. What does it do to our minds yeah. if we keep doing these actions? Is there a mutilation of the mind? Yeah. There is. Oh, that's a good point. You create a rut in your mind when you go down a certain path consistently. I mean, it, it's, it, that path grows stronger and stronger, and it's easier to come back to it. That's what we call habit. We got in the marriage, and how long your mm -hmm. parents and you have been married? Even in Adventism, that's rare, because even in the church, it's the same, kind of the same 51 percent of people get divorced, and we marry, and that's the, what I read. So you think my wife should get a medal? Oh, both of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think both of you guys should be commended, and your parents especially. Fantastic. I well, couldn't do it. Jesus also raised questions about the keeping of the fifth commandment. What's the fifth commandment? Honor. Honor your father and your mother, right? When the scribes and the Pharisees began to criticize how Jesus and his disciples were not correctly washing their hands before eating, do we know what they did? what the rules were about washing hands? The answer is no. We just know that they had an elaborate way of ceremonially washing their hands. And you were not supposed to eat, especially if you'd been in a public place and you come home and you're, you want to prepare to eat now. You had to elaborately wash your hands in a very strict way before you could eat. We would suspect that it's similar to what some do today. Yeah. to wash their hands in, in the Jewish culture. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to start talking about surgeons here. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't talk about them. <laughs> well, Jesus pointed out how they had directly contradicted the fourth commandment. And look at this in Mark 7. You, you, this is a familiar passage. And Jesus continued, You have a clever way of rejecting God's law in order to uphold your own teaching. For Moses commanded, respect your father and your mother, and whoever curses his father or his mother is to be put to death. Now, that's from the Old Testament. That's what it says in the Old Testament. But you teach, Jesus said, that if a person has something he could use to help his father or mother, but says, this is korban, which means it belongs to God, he is excused from helping his father and mother. In this way, the teaching you pass on to others cancels out the word of God. And there are many other things like this that you do. Now, how would this actually work? What, what, how did the Corban thing work? Do you remember? Do you know? If you happen to have, let's say, if you owned a home, and your parents said, well, we, you know, getting older, they don't have, they maybe lost, they don't, they don't have flocks and herds anymore. I mean, this was in the days when you had, I mean, it was a, a hand-to-mouth kind of living. So the, young, the older son would, would say, okay, mom and dad, here's a place for you to stay. But if he, maybe the son doesn't have a place, he, he would have to welcome him to his own home, and he doesn't want to welcome them into his own home because he wants to use his own home for his own benefit. He's, he would say, no, this is Corban, which means that you can't use it now. When, whenever I die, it becomes the property of the church. And suddenly, mom and dad are out. So the children were a welfare system in that day. Yes. It was a social mm -hmm. security. It was... Um, mm -hmm. Well, and the Pharisees seemed to argue ad nauseum, endlessly, about the priority of the laws given by God in the Old Testament. And what they would do is this. They, they tried to construct a, a, a sequel like this. This is the most important rule. This is the next most important rule. Down, 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 like this. And if you did that, then if you, if you were trying to obey a more important rule, then you had the right to ignore the less important rule. I mean, and think of all, I can think of many, can, can you think, let me just ask you, can you think of a time when maybe a, a rules, two, two laws or two rules from the Old Testament are in conflict? Let me tell you, let me give you an extreme example. I know of a woman who had a serious, one of my patients years ago in Africa, who had a very serious heart condition, just was barely making it. Her heart was just able to keep up with her. She got pregnant. Mm. Mm. Well, what do you think is happening? 
Or it's an abortion. Yes. Heart can't handle it. So now, we don't believe in abortions, but if you don't abort the baby, what happens? It's going to die. Mother and baby die. So here's a case where you've got a conflict. That's that. In, in medicine, there's all kinds of times when there's one rule can conflict in one way or another with another. But that was, that's an obvious, really big one. What happened? She died. She didn't, she didn't want an abortion. So I said, okay, that's your choice. And she died. About what month did she last till? I think it was about the sixth month, mm. something like sixth or seventh. How sad. Yeah. Mm. To then they could have saved her. Uh, well, I could have saved her there if she was willing, but I mean, mm. and, uh, and this was a rural church in, I mean, a rural hospital in Africa, and, you know, if I had, com if I had actually performed an abortion, especially if I had done it without, I to kill you. without having the blessing of the fathers, yeah. oh boy. But as a result, the woman died. Well, so do you have any subtle little? Do we have today any little subtle ways of producing technical loopholes in order to try to avoid doing what we know the law specifically says we should do? I know. Growing up, um, there were a lot of rules set around if you could swim or not on Sabbath. Yes. What you could swim and the activities performed. How much of you can get wet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember a lot of rules like that. We, I shouldn't tell you this maybe on national, on TV, but we used to have a great time. I was in charge of a whole hospital, 125 bed hospital, all by myself as the only doctor for quite a while. And every six weeks, we would say to the nurses and other people, okay, we're leaving on Friday afternoon. We'll come back on Sunday afternoon. We have to have a break. Because it was 24-7. Yeah. I mean, there was no break for me whatsoever. And that hospital now, I think, has 10 doctors. But th that was a hospital. I had it all to myself. So we would go, and the easiest place for us to go was a lake not too far away. And our kids were one, two, three, like that, years old. And we would say, now, you can play in the water, but you know, don't get completely wet. Well, of course, you know how well that worked. <laughs> <laughs> and we smiled and enjoyed it. Well, there's a very sad story told in Matthew 19, 16 to 22. It's a story you're all familiar with. Let me just read part of it here. Once a man came to Jesus, and, and you need to read the little bit just before it, because it helps to give us an idea of what's going on. Some people brought children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples scolded the people. Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not stop them because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. He placed his hands on them and then went away. So he was here probably blessing a whole lot of young kids. And guess what? A young man, a rich young ruler, saw him blessing them. And, and no doubt this rich young ruler recognized that even though he, he, he thought of himself as a saint, there was still a spiritual lack in his life. So he said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to receive eternal life? Can't you just place your hand on me and bless me too? And Jesus answered, What? There is only one who is good. Keep the commandments if you want to enter life. What commandments, he asked. And of course, you, c you can see his face is brightening up because he knows that he's, keep he's keeping the commandments, right? He's kept these commandments all backwards and forwards. And the young man, re I have obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else do I need to do? Well, Jesus quotes from the Ten Commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not commit adultery, and so forth. He says, I have obeyed all these commandments. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now this story has a lot more meaning when you understand the thinking of the Jews. What was the thinking of the Jews? If you're well off financially, God's smiling on you. You're blessed. You must be doing living right. It's Deuteronomy 28. Right. If you do what's right, God will bless you. If God's blessing you, what happens? You get rich. You, you get rich. 
If you're doing what's wrong, God curses you. And what happens if you're cursed? You get poor. You get poor. So you see the people driving by in their Lexuses and their, their Mercedes, etc., and those obviously are the saints, right? Clearly, no question about it. It was, a, it was a very simple system. It didn't take very long to figure it out. And that's exactly what the Pharisees wanted them to think because what did, he, what did they do? They were dressed in all their fine robes and they had horses and they had all this kind of stuff. And there they go. There's the saints. You can that tell. The story was clear back to the first book in the Bible, the yeah. book of Job. Yeah. You know, look at you, Job. It's perfectly yeah. obvious you must have done something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what was Jesus asking this young man to do? The young man took it that Jesus was asking him to not be a saint because he was going to be poor. Jesus was asking this man to give up his proof of his righteousness. Mm. He's saying, give up your sainthood. I mean, who would do that? But I don't think he's saying wealth is there's something wrong with wealth itself. Uh, what was the problem? Well, bec but you cannot serve two masters. Mm -hmm. If your wealth is your master, then there's a problem. But I don't think God give well, people and, good and, things. And how do we know that that's true? <laughs> did he ask the disciples to give up everything they had? No. Did he, ask, did he ask Nicodemus to give up everything he had? No. No. Joseph of Arimathea? No. Barnabas? These were all people who were wealthy. Simon? Abraham. Abraham? Job. Job? Job did it twice, didn't he? Why did Jesus ask this young ruler to give up all his wealth? Why did Jesus narrow in on that? You want to say what you said again? <laughs> I just said because you cannot have two masters because uh, his wealth was his master, although he did all the, you know, outward steps. His wealth was his God, and you can't serve two gods. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you read the passage from Ellen White, she said it was really sad for Jesus because he realized that this young man could have been a really, really useful and helpful disciple. He would have been a wonderful addition to the Christian church. But what was the problem? Jesus recognized that this young man's wealth was his God. Jesus knew that full and complete obedience and surrender to God was essential for living a true Christian life. He knew that soon his disciples would be scattered throughout the then known world, preaching the gospel, living almost penilessly, and eventually being martyred the rich young ruler would have to adjust his priorities to fit with such a crowd. Think about it. Is there anything, in the, the rich young ruler, it sounds to me like he was a young Pharisee or somewhere in yep. there. It doesn't say that, but it had to be. Probably a member of the Sanhedrin. Yeah, and they had a good thing going there. They could be hmm. as religious as they want. They just rake the cream out of the temple coffers. Of course. Well, Ellen White comments, Nothing short of obedience can be accepted. Self-surrender is the substance of the teachings of Christ. Often it is presented and joined in language that seems authoritative because there is no other way to save man than to cut away those things which, if entertained, will demoralize the whole being. Desire of Ages, page 523. Wow. That's pretty potent language, isn't it? So in all of this, we see that Jesus very carefully and consistently upheld not only the Ten Commandments, but also all of the Old Testament. So now we're going to start to summarize. Who was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself. He is the one who had given all that stuff in the Old Testament. He is the one who led the children of Israel. He is the one who performed all those things in the Old Testament. Is he going to, if he's a God who is consistent, Malachi 3, 6 says, I am God, I do not change. And we can look at other verses if we had time. Uh, other verses say the same thing. He's not going to say something different. Why does he look different in the Old Testament than he looks in the New Testament? People. Yeah. The situation. Yeah, the, the, the situation had changed. The people were in a completely different situation. He was meeting the people where they were. Yeah, exactly. So now the God of the Old Testament is standing there, right there with him, looking like an ordinary human being. Speaking of the law, Jesus said, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
That is, to fill up the measure of the law's requirement, to give an example of perfect conformity to the will of God. I'm quoting from Ellen White again. His mission was to magnify the law and make it honorable, Isaiah 42, 21. He was to show the spiritual nature of the law and to present its far-reaching principles and to make plain its eternal obligations. Jesus, the express image of the Father's person, the effulgence of his glory, the self-denying Redeemer, throughout his pilgrimage of love on earth, was a living representation of the character of the law of God. In his life, it is made manifest that heaven-born love, Christ-like principles, underlie the laws of eternal rectitude. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, pages 48 and 49. We know that most of the challenges in modern times against keeping the Ten Commandments are specifically at attempts to get rid of the Seventh-day Sabbath. And can you find anything in the Gospels or anything in the, in the story of Jesus that suggests that? Take, take your time, your, your, a few minutes sometime and look through the miracles Jesus performed on the Sabbath and see if there's any hint that he was trying to do away with the Ten Commandments. If he wasn't trying to do away with them, what was he doing? Yeah. He was, cha was he changing, trying to challenge the, the Pharisees' view of how to he keep He was Sabbath? trying to say, this is the way it ought to be observed. This is the way those laws are supposed to be understood. Yeah. Well, why does God still stick with those old rules? And I would like to read this particular passage. It's found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 315, paragraph 1. God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character, and it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of, the God, of God's law, and when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Clothed in the glorious apparel of Christ's righteousness, they have a place at the king's feast. They have a right to join the blood-washed throng. The law is our guide to the kind of behavior that will be acceptable in heaven. Don't you want to be there? 